So today I'm reflecting on the imagination and I would like to do that through um, a, through the consideration of a particular image. Um, the reason um, uh, images can be so helpful in the understanding of the imagination is because imagination is a word which has its roots in the Latin word imago. And imago is the same, um, it's, that's where we get the word image from. So, so, so for, for awareness, for consciousness, for, our, um, for us to consider and attend to images is to invigorate, um, uh, enliven, and and um, awaken uh, imagination. Um, this is how I see it, at least. Um, but it's the the clues in the word, the clues in the name. You know, imagination relates to images, and so to the extent that we can um, contemplate, reflect on, and um, images, um, perhaps we, we can find insight and wisdom and guidance in those images. And so the image I'd like to uh, pre can present for your consideration today is the image of the child. And this is an interesting image for many reasons. The first is that we were all children once at one stage in, the, in our life's journey. Uh, in one stage in our development, at one point in historical time, we were children. And um, thus, we all have a kind of ancient memory of childhood. Um, the consciousness of you listening to this video today is um, a consciousness of someone of a particular age, at a particular time in your life, a particular stage in your life. And I'm sure life has had its twists and turns as your life history has, has unfolded uh, through uh, space and time. Um, but but, but um, there is a kind of psychological core or like a memory of a place that you were once, even if it may be fading from your memory, even if um, it's hard and hard to remember now and a bit vague, it's still there. It's a, still a reality. It's still a, a, a phase through which you went, a consciousness through which you moved and a place that you explored. And so I would like to say that, that the, the image of the child is a psychological reality for us as living subjects, as consciousness, as souls. Um, the image of the child is there somewhere. And when I say the image of the child, one layer of meaning of that image could just be your childhood the innocence of that time, the joy of that time, the wonder and the awe of that time. Um, and most particularly, um, um, the thing I'd like to point attention to is the, the, sh the, the sheer openness of imagination in that time. Um, it, it, it occurs to me that when I reflect on my childhood, that I was living in a world of imagination this was before duality, before ego had developed or a sense of a more um, isolated and, and, and self-aware sense of self, sense of ego had emerged before that time. I would go into the woods and pick up sticks and, um, you know, hit at trees with the sticks and, um, and, and, and be caught up in this whole fantasy world um, and play with my friends and we would make up the games and the worlds in which we live and we would all spontaneously play out that drama, you know, a child at play. Um, open, 
innocent, unconscious, um, naive in, in many senses, but centrally and importantly, um, um, imaginative. In fact, the, the child is not self-conscious or aware of this imagination, but it's, it says the imagination is our being as children. In a, in a very deep sense. Um, the stories we're told, the stories we, we, we are read are real and alive and the myth of it is living and dragons are real and knights and warriors and monsters and fairy tales, they're all real in this place, in this context of awareness, this, this childhood. So, so, so the image of the child, the consciousness of the child is a consciousness saturated in imagination and open and curious and exploratory and, and energetic, energetically and passionately exploring these fantasy worlds, the possibilities of them, being immersed in them, being lost in them, following them. Um, being scared of them, being scared of monsters, being, um, uh, you know, enthralled by different heroes and different stories. Um, the point is that it's a world of imagination and it's very real. And it's a memory that I have sitting here now, um, perhaps not, uh, perhaps at one level, seeing that I am a child no longer and that I have matured and grown through time. So to the extent that I am identified with that in me, which is the procession of historical time, um, I feel that I'm not that anymore. But, but I remember that that was the truth at one point for me, for my soul. So that's one level of the child image, which I wanted to, to, to point out that it's a psychological reality. Um, and let me see if I can read a few things out as well, which might add some more layers of context and meaning to this image. So for instance, in the New Testament, Christ says, this is the King James, version in Matthew 18 3 verily I say unto you except ye be converted and become as little children ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven so that's a pretty interesting thing for, for Christ to have said except ye be converted and become as little children ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Let's just hold that in our minds for a moment. Um, here's another thing that Christ said in Mark 8, 18. Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And actually the completion of that is and don't you remember so mark 8 18 is do you not do you have eyes but fail mark 18 18 mark 8 18 is do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear and don't you remember don't you remember that's another saying Two really interesting sayings. Do you, do, do you have eyes but fail to see? Do you have ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember? So that idea of remembering memory relates to something I've just said about the child archetype, the child energy, um, this image of the child actually being a memory for us, an ancient memory, we could say, in the in the timeline storyline of our own lives the development of our souls it may be quite an ancient memory 
and and Christ saying, "Do you have eyes, but but don't see, ears, but don't hear, and don't you remember?" And I think part of what's being alluded to with that is that as we mature, you see, as we grow up, um, as we grow up and we move through historical time, we move from childhood from eight, nine, ten years old to 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. As the age goes on, as age happens, as time happens, we lose our sight and we lose our ability to hear. Our perception becomes corrupted our perception becomes dulled the energy with which we engage with imagination the energy with which we breathe life into it and engage with it and play with it and follow it and 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 are in tune with the truth of imagination that harmony with imagination in childhood becomes dulled somehow becomes dulled through the progression of time one way of understanding this and i um it's not by no means um, an exhaustive interpretation or, or or a final interpretation it's just one way of interpreting it um there's a the 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 biblical story of the fall of adam and eve the fall of adam and eve they eat the fruit of knowledge of good and evil and thus they fall from paradise. Now, in a sense, the innocence of childhood is a, a nostalgia and a paradise for us because in that consciousness, we're not aware of mortality, of death, of entropy, of finitude, of the thing, of the fact that things fall apart, of that, of the fact that things decay, of um, evil we're not aware of evil we're not aware of the possibility of evil in our own hearts or the or the possibility of good uh the 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 agency of choice you know good and evil this emergence of moral agency the sense of myself as a moral agent as someone with responsibility is what is something that emerges as we develop we, we transition from childhood to adulthood, adulthood, as William Blake, uh, uh, William Blake has some poems, uh, term the songs of innocence, the innocence of childhood and the songs of experience. And so we move from innocence to experience and with experience, with adulthood, with maturity comes a, a moral sense, a sense of good and evil and an awareness of certain realities and certain truths and then psychologically we could think of this as a fall as i say it's not the only layer of interpretation or way to read that story at all but it's a psychological way of reading it and um to me at least it chimes very true it's um it's um a really um deep uh, perception actually of of what happens to all of us as as we as souls move through this life from innocence from a paradisal unconscious innocence of adam and eve before the fall walking with god free in the imagination and um, to imbibing a certain consciousness and awakening to to certain truths to responsibility to the awareness of good and evil the awareness of myself as a moral agent and the awareness that my actions and my thoughts matter and and that evil is a force in the world and stuff like that so that fall that fall um corrupts the imagination. The innocence of childhood is lost. Maturity awakens. Experience awakens. And 
um, an uh, ego awakens, a sense of my own identity, my own um, choices, um, etc. As we mature, and in that process of maturity, many things are gained, of course. Um, our, our propensity for discernment, for understanding different forms of knowledge, um, the, the fruits and the rewards of choosing um, good and virtuous um, behaviors and working towards things and accomplishing things and embodying certain values and pursuing certain visions. Um, and then the, the negative consequences of um, not doing those things and um, the struggle of self-consciousness so so there's there's a there's a good and a bad say um consequence of this movement this movement relates to what owen barfield called the withdrawal of participation as far as i understand it i'm drawing this idea i've not read barfield i'm drawing these ideas from a recent book i read by mark vernon called a secret history of christianity which um i offered some reflections on in my last video um but as a, a way of understanding some of the ideas that he's talking about in that book is is through the story i'm telling at the moment is that so in childhood in innocence there is um what owen barfield called an original participation a kind of unconscious engagement um, and participation in life the child at play the imaginative drama the feeling of intuitions and voices and images and imaginations as as the world as the outside the inside there's no difference between outside and inside it's just this really immersive and intense and engaged imaginative drama we are one with the imagination there is no ego separate from the imagination there is just the innocence of childhood which is defined by this theme of imagination original participation and then what i've mentioned with this myth of the fall is that there is at some point a fall usually in kind of adolescence as we as we mature into our early 20s maybe we and as as we get more experience as time goes on as we age um there is a withdrawal of that participation so now the trees don't speak to us anymore and now um toys aren't alive anymore you know toys have lost their soul because to the child at play the toys are of course living they have a vitality they have an animus you, you know and they are engaged as such they are not inanimate toys which from the eye which cannot see of the adult looking at the child at play it's just like oh silly child just playing with this random object that's a bit strange but from the eye that can see from the interiority of the child which i want to stress we all can remember we all really can remember a time when was, this was true for us. So from the interior of it, the toy is, of course, animate. It is ensouled and it is speaking to us, playing with us, um, part of a broader drama. It is um, rich and imaginative. Um, so, so that's an original participation. And then we that we become alienated somehow through this fall you see and and the toys lose their soul the trees lose their soul um nature loses its soul and it's like oh that's just that place you know what happens is I, um samuel taylor coleridge calls it the film of familiarity which is a really beautiful way of putting it i think which is where some film some veil something comes over our eyes and we can no longer see as the child sees we do have eyes but we cannot see because some film of familiarity has come over our eyes this i see this as something like the sands of time something like age something like 
um, the progression of the years, or as, as William Blake put it, experience. Experience. Experience brings in the film of familiarity. And, and now you see there is no longer um, an, the awe and the novelty and the richness of experience that was there in childhood, because now that's just that place I've been to many times before. That's just that toy I've played with many times before. And that's just this experience I've repeated many times in my life. I have a cognitive category now built up for that. And so I don't actually see that anymore. It doesn't reveal itself to me anymore. That is this category. That's like, oh, that's just that thing. And this is part of um, what happens with age. And um, yeah, there's, there's positives and negatives. Again, like it's, it's, a hel it's a helpful heuristic. It's a helpful shortcut to not have to pay intense attention to everything all the time. Um, so experience can bring a certain w wisdom with it too. Um, but but I want to just emphasize, I want to explore and emphasize the theme of the imagination and the image of the child in this video. So we'll focus on that. So there is an original participation in childhood. There is a fall and a withdrawal of partici participation um, as we emerge out of childhood. These terms, original participation and withdrawal, withdrawal of participation, are words used by Owen Barfield, who was a contemporary of um, Tol Tolkien and C.S. Lewis. And so participation is withdrawn. Um, things have lost their soul. And this the film of familiarity has come over our eyes and our ears. And we do not remember what it was like to truly attend to the world and to things. Um, so if you think of um, something like cynicism, the attitude of cynicism, uh, bitterness, um, bitterness and cynicism, um, you could say that these attitudes are really the product of this film of familiarity, layers and layers and layers of experience, um, veiling um, our, 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 our capacity to see, to really truly see with the eye of the child, to see in the truest sense or the realest sense. You see, a child is truly paying attention to the words you say, to an experience they're having, to an emotion they're having, to, to a game they're playing. Um, there's maybe not a differentiated sense of ego, um, but there is an intense, energized engagement and richness of imagination. And that bright light of childhood is kind of... It's kind of, it kind of withers or something like that. And, and these films, these layers, layers and layers of familiarity and experience come over the top. Um, and, then, and so our perceptions become tainted, corrupted, or distorted, we could say, in some, in some ways. You know, how we attend to other people, how we attend to nature just the beauty of nature i i really could go on forever about this because you know you know really let me pause on this for a minute actually because i had I had an idea about this you know really in a way education is is a process of removing that film of familiarity let me just um get this Coleridge quote up for you, which I think might help to illuminate this idea a bit. So Coleridge said, in consequence of the film of familiarity and selfish solicitude, we have eyes yet see not, ears that hear not, and hearts that neither feel 
nor understand. Beautiful. So, so thinking, so, so building on this, think of the child as an energy uh, within you. And Jung um, talked about the child archetype, um, an archetype, an image, a primal pattern, um, a, a deep reality or something like that. And think of it as um, a source of energy and a source of light and a source of power deep, deep within your soul. And then think of this film of familiarity that Coleridge is talking about as in some sense obscuring and dampening that primal energy. Um, and, and as the film of familiarity comes over our eyes and comes over our ears and, 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 and taints our ability to truly feel and to truly understand, um, our, our, our perceptions are damp, dampened, basically. Our, our world, our reality, our experience, like the, the phenomenology of like our, our lives, our perceptions are dampened. When I say dampened, I kind of mean I'm reading um, Fearful Symmetry by Northrop Fry, which is a book about William Blake's thought. And, and, and the sense I'm getting at the moment is that it's really think of it as like heightened energy and dampened energy some of um you know to, the, the selfhood or ego is basically to do with in blake's vision as i understand it is it to do with an impotence of energy like a dampening down of energy a lowering of the energetic potential because perceptions are dulled and there's nothing to inspire us. Nothing numinous, nothing soulful, nothing mysterious, nothing um, awesome, awe-inspiring, beautiful. None of that's really stimulating us or inspiring us um, or enthusing us. You know, inspiration means the spirit, the pneuma, right? The, the creative spirit of the world coming into our soul. And that's what charisma is. That's what um, energized thought and passion is. Enthusiasm is related to a Greek word, which again has to do with connection to the sacred, connection to the heavens, connection to maybe Plato's forms, the transcendental world, the good, the true, the beautiful. Enthusiasm, inspiration, these words have deep roots and their roots have to do with a perception of the sacred, a perception of the transcendent. And so we lose that, you know, we lose that energy, that enthusiasm that energy of childhood. Another interesting feature of this child image is that the child is boundlessly energetic. Um, this is what I've noticed. I've um, got, uh, like little cousins in my family and whenever um, I'm around them, no matter how much energy I have, they have much more like abundance more like so much more energy to play and to explore their imagination so so this energy idea is really interesting too because again think about death one understanding of what death is is a is the ultimate lack of energy really like life is energy death from one way of looking at it is just the impotence of energy the, 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 the running out of energy. The energy just gets low until we are entirely inanimate, you see. Um, so, so Blake's vision, William Blake's vision, that I'm getting through um, uh, uh, Fry's Fearful Symmetry, is all about how imagination is about energy, about enthusiasm, about inspiration, about deep engagement with the world. It's, it's a way of consciousness. It, it's, 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 a, it's a place of consciousness. It's um, a perception and a, a rich and energized perception. And then the lack of imagination is the opposite, you know, is, is a dull perception, 
um, covered over by the film of familiarity um, and so forth. And so um, another thing I would comment on is that um, I still can remember one of the deepest depressions in my life. And part of the prevailing mood of that depression was apathy, apathy. I don't care. I don't have the energy to pursue any ambition. Why would I set a goal for myself? Why would I pursue a hope or a dream? I can't, I can't do it. I'm impotent. I don't have the strength nor the power nor the will to do any of that. And that's how we are become depressed. We are depressed. We are energetically stifled. Lack of imagination, in a sense. Lack of energy, lack of enthusiasm. An absence of enthusiasm is something I definitely noticed in the depths of depression. A lack of enthusiasm. Again, that Greek word. Um, I think it's n Theo, theo meaning divine or God and in God. So enthusiasm, I'm, I'm at one with God. I'm engaged with God, like Adam and Eve in paradise, walking with God. So that was not the case in depression. The enthusiasm was most notably lacking from a purely psychological level. Um, so how do we reconcile this story? I've talked about original participation in childhood. I've talked about the withdrawal of participation in alienation and depression in maturity. Um, so how do we reconcile it? Well, this is the, this is what I'm, what I'm considering and thinking through at the moment. So artists, poets, painters, um, just, just, just pe just humans individuals pursuing enthusiastic and inspired individuals pursuing their the truth of their imagination that's what the broadest definition of artist for me is is, is would be that it doesn't have to be a particular form but i'm using those as examples what they are doing, and this is what Coleridge said, um, is they're removing the film of familiarity. They're peeling that away for you. They're helping you to see the world anew. They're helping give you eyes that see and ears that hear. Great music does that. It helps us really attend to sound attend to music attend to harmony music educate great music educates our perceptions educates our ears great painting educates our eyes and so through the arts we are given eyes to see ears to hear um our perception is educated through great art um this dulling of imagination this film of familiarity is removed through contact with gr great art, with beauty. Um, and so beauty, what it can do is um, remove the film of familiar familiarity, remove the kind of jadedness and cynicism of experience and um, awaken the childlike energy again, um, and may awaken the enthusiasm and the inspiration of that childlike consciousness. But now at a higher level, at a more engaged level, at a more conscious and empowered level. So it's um, um, original participation, fall into withdrawal of participation, and then um, redemption so it's again like the biblical narrative would be you know paradise fall redemption paradise fall redemption in Owen Barfield it would be um, original participation withdrawal of participation and final participation so this final participation is about kind of harmonizing experience and innocence harmonizing age 
and and um, the, uh, the 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 expansion of consciousness that comes with age with youth and to bring those together is what the artist is doing so the painter is educating our eyes our perception helping us to see and not merely have eyes uh, the musician is helping us to hear and not merely have ears and they're all helping us to remember in a sense remember what it was like to perceive that way in the beginning in the paradisal childhood state of pure imagination we could say um another thing i noticed about this was that, that really um my feeling is that all education all real education is again removing this film of familiarity like um we open to whole new worlds of love and gratitude and appreciation when we are able to attend anew to um what's before us what's um to what's in front of us and um, when we are able to perceive with greater intensity and great greater um clarity um so what do i mean well i mean that like the spirit of gratitude itself like um really feeling grateful in life is 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 like again a perception like oh oh wow i have food on the table someone has worked to produce that food to get that food um the food's been cooked it tastes amazing and this is sustaining my life oh wow i can breathe and i'm alive oh wow the probability of life is some crazy statistical number um oh wow like we have day and night and the sun provides all this energy for all life to grow and flourish and like we are in the center of a mystery here a real mystery and um ingratitude um bitterness cynicism um a, 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 a kind of ugly rejection of um different uh, of life you know um is born of this f many layers of this film of familiarity many layers of experience and jadedness oh it's just another day oh it's just some food you know this this attitude of of not attending not really seeing what's before you not seeing the glory and the beauty that's before you uh, forgetting this is this christ what he said about you do not remember do you not remember what it is to perceive to really truly see to really truly hear to really truly perceive like to really attend to really let it in let the information in let the magnificence and the glory of it in to perceive it to be awestruck to be awestruck to be enthused to be inspired well my feeling my sense is that it is all our birthright we've all been there as i want to emphasize you have been there it is a memory for you like it's there it's a psychological reality but but the but the thing is forgetting the thing is falling into these rigid patterns and habits of thought like oh it's just some food that someone's cooked for me or you know that i've just bought from the shop and now i'm eating it yeah cool but like historically if you broadened the perspective of your identity many have starved throughout history many are starving right now and so even a morsel of food that you've just gone and just got because it's another day because that's what you always do is something to be grateful for to something to appreciate to something to, to, to savor and to be really grateful for and so um, how I'd like to wrap this video up, I, I suppose, is that is that imagination opens us up to love. Um, um, as William Blake said, if the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is, infinite. And so we are opened up to 
to the, the great love that sustains the world um, as a, like food is a, is a huge thing, F- food, shelter, health, simple things, but, but really important things. I don't know if there are many things more important than these, these really fundamental things, you know, family, uh, friends, um, just, just, the, just the, the, these, these things you see that are so essential to who we are, that, that, that it's so easy to, 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 for, for an attitude to develop, for a character, for a posture, for an orientation to develop towards all that and say, oh, it's just so familiar, so it's of little worth. Um, it's just, it's not even a conscious thing, it's more just an unconscious habit of like, oh yeah, but that's just, as I say, like a category that we understand, have experienced many a million times. You've eaten so many meals, you've seen your family so many times, you've seen your friends so many times. Why bring gratitude to that? Why would you? Because you're familiar to it, right? And so you have eyes, but you're not truly seeing. There is a kind of blocking, a clouding of perception that goes there uh, with, 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 with experience, with habit, we could say, or something like that, habit, the habit, the f- Coleridge's film of familiarity, it builds up, you see. And so poets, musicians, painters, artists, all individuals, I, I really feel, all humans, we, we are born with creative imagination, we are born with this potential. Um, do you not remember, you know, do you not remember being in that place at some point? Um, through the bringing forth of this energy you see enthusiastically with inspiration etc through the attention um, to the to the creative imagination what that does is it removes the film of familiarity for you individually and for the culture and so culture really develops through the removing of the film of familiarity um, we are able to perceive things differently with our eyes, hear things differently with our ears. Um, education itself is really a, a removing of this film. And then through a removing of this film, a new perception is possible. A new engagement with life is possible. And um, a sensitivity to love and to, to the truth, um, like a, a real feeling of engagement of rich deep engagement with reality um is possible and is available and is really our 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 birthright um and so my sense is that art and the creative imagination um i mean this is the ultimate value of art art in the broadest sense art as expression not mere expression, art as, uh, as the energetic outflow or the exuberance of the creative imagination, however that manifests itself in our lives, you see. Art as the resistance of, the overcoming of, or maybe the transcendence would be better. Art as the transcendence of this film of familiarity. Um, it has a redemptive power it really does and so perhaps this is what um, Christ was alluding to in those sayings that I I read out and and what Coleridge is talking about with it what what Coleridge is aiming at with his poetry what what poets are aiming to do what artists are aiming to do musicians are aiming to do if they're doing it well if they're really in tune with the genius and in tune with the spirit that moves them, then they can help to remove this film of familiarity. Think of this film as a dross, as dust, as um, rust, as dust and rust that kind of corrupts and interferes with something that is intrinsically valuable and worth restoring and appreciating and attending to. That's kind of how I see it. There's an alchemical image for that, actually, which is the image of lead. 
a leaden consciousness, a heavy lead-like consciousness. And the alchemists, of course, were looking to transmute and transform that lead into gold, into the rough, into the ultimate um, expression of the creative imagination. And so we could think of the lead-like consciousness as a rusting of the imagination and the gold-like consciousness as a restoration of and an appreciation of and an exuberance of the imagination. Um, so thank you for listening. And those were just some thoughts which um, tie together a few different themes I've been reflecting on and books I've been reading and things I've been trying to understand. So we have this the biblical model of paradise, full redemption. We have um, original participation, withdrawal of participation, final participation. Um, and we have uh, the innocence of childhood, um, the 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 cynicism of of adolescence or maturity, and then the the remembering of the the remembering of and the return to a childlike creative engagement with the world at a higher newer more empowered more full more rich more developed more cultivated level so it's kind of like a cycle but it's almost also like a spiral but most fundamentally, it's like a return. It's it's like going back, a hearkening back, a remembering who we are. And that's what Mufasa says in the sky to Simba in, a, in, in, in his vision in the middle of the Lion King. Uh, that's one of his central messages in, uh, in the revelation um, that that Simba has of Mufasa. Mufasa's message is remember who you are. And so I'd like to end with that. And um, yeah, thanks for listening. Um, love to hear your comments or anything like that below. Bye.